I could not live without champagne. In victory, I deserve it. In defeat, I need it. That is a quote from Winston Churchill, and it's from this 522-page book about Winston Churchill's illnesses. Nothing but his illnesses. The name of the book is Winston Churchill's Illnesses, written by two British physicians. The quote about champagne comes from the chapter titled, Was Churchill an Alcoholic? The book was published in 2020, and using all of the latest analysis about alcohol addiction, the authors conclude that Winston Churchill exhibited none of the traits of alcoholism, and that the image of Churchill as a very heavy drinker was much exaggerated, including by himself. A note, many close observers of the British Prime Minister, the book notes many prime, close observers of the British Prime Minister saying things like this. Personally, throughout the time I knew him, I never saw him the worse for drink. The glass of weak whiskey, like the cigars, was more a symbol than anything else. One glass lasted him for hours. Churchill himself once wrote, I had been brought up and trained to have the utmost contempt for people who got drunk. So it turns out alcohol his alcoholism was not one of Winston Churchill's many, many health problems. It, con it contributed to this book with the chap it, this book is, is filled with all of those health problems. And each chapter title describes a separate major health event in Winston Churchill's life. Chapter titles like chest pain during Christmas 1941 at the White House, pneumonia and atrial fibrillation in December 1943 in Carthage, and acute stroke in June 1953 in London. During all of those illnesses, including the stroke, Winston Churchill was serving as the now still widely regarded greatest British prime minister in history a British prime minister who rallied his country to continue to fight Hitler when it seemed that all was lost. When he suffered an acute stroke, Prime Minister Churchill simply retreated to his country house for a few months. When he made his first public speeches after the stroke, Churchill worried that he wouldn't be able to stay standing through the speeches, but he did. And no one, no one except his doctors and family and very closest staff knew that Winston Churchill had a stroke. His cabinet did not know that the prime minister had a stroke. When Churchill first mentioned the stroke publicly a year after he had that stroke, there was no controversy about it at all. Winston Churchill won World War II by strategizing with, sometimes side by side, the President of the United States who served longer than any other president and whose health was never good. Franklin Delano Roosevelt once fell to the floor of his private railroad car, clutching his chest in agony in the company of only his son James, who he told he didn't think he was going to make it. He suffered unreported episodes that seemed like minor strokes. He was ill for long periods of time and left the White House for long periods of time to recuperate. Franklin Roosevelt lost the ability to walk or even stand up at the age of 39 when he was struck with polio. He had been a political rising star in New York and many expected him to retire to the life of a country gentleman on his Hyde Park estate paid for entirely by his mother and never work again. But Franklin Roosevelt recovered to the point where he won two elections for governor of New York and then won four presidential elections in a row. And he did all of that in a wheelchair. He faked the ability to stand for the occasionally big speech, but he would be clinging to the podium with the arm strength that he worked so hard to build up so that he could hold himself up and he would be pouring with sweat as he held himself up with all of his arm strength. And he worked his way through those rare standing speeches, 
that way. Pouring the kind of sweat that today's HD television cameras would pick up and dwell on and perhaps make some observers say it was painful to watch. But Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill had the good fortune to serve as the highest elected officials in their countries long before television news could cover their every move and long before Twitter could have people pumping out their instant reactions to their public appearances. Franklin Delano Roosevelt believed that it would be painful to watch him being lifted in and out of a car by Secret Service agents, so he never allowed cameras to capture that. Elaborate steps were taken when his train would arrive or depart so that he could be transferred from the car to the train, lifted in and out, without anyone seeing and without anyone thinking that it was painful to watch. Kids grew up in America during the FDR presidency not knowing that the president could not walk. Caroline Morrell was an 11-year-old growing up in Washington, D.C., when her father, a lawyer with connections to the Roosevelt administration, brought her to a reception at the White House where, with no cameras present, present, President Roosevelt was rolled into the East Room in his wheelchair. Caroline Morrell's eyes widened. She tugged her father's sleeve and looked up and whispered, I won't tell anyone. She felt she was in the presence of a secret about the president's condition, and she felt as most Americans did, and as the press corps did way back then, that the president's condition should be respected. 11-year-old Caroline Morrell did not think that in her one lucky moment of being in the room with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that he was painful to watch. Painful to watch quickly became an oft-repeated phrase on Twitter last night during the Pennsylvania Senate campaign debate because Democratic candidate John Fetterman suffered a stroke this spring and has not fully recovered 100% of his verbal fluency. Here is the first thing that he said in his debate with Republican Mehmet Oz. I'm running to serve Pennsylvania. He's running to use Pennsylvania. Here's a man that spent more than $20 million of his own money to try to buy that seat. I'm also having to talk about something called the Oz rule, that if he's on TV, he's lying. He did that during his career on his TV show. He's done that during his campaign about lying about our record here. And he's also lying probably during this debate. And let's also talk about the elephant in the room. I had a stroke. He's never let me forget that. And I might miss some words during this debate, mush two words together, but it knocked me down, but I'm going to keep coming back up. And this campaign is all about, to me, is about fighting for everyone in Pennsylvania that ever got knocked down that needs to get back up. While he was brilliantly winning World War II, Franklin Roosevelt once fell asleep in the Oval Office in the middle of signing his name to a letter. That was not painful to watch because no one got to see that. The painful to watch reviews last night seemed oddly disconnected to this country's own experience with illness in elected office, including the experience of two members of the United States Senate who had strokes this year. Democratic Senator Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico suffered a stroke in January. He took time off and eventually came back to work. Our first guest tonight, Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, suffered a stroke in May. He took time off and he came back to work. Senator Bernie Sanders had a heart attack three years ago when he was running for president and he took time off and went back to work, not just as a United States senator, but he went back to running for president. And people continued to vote for Bernie Sanders for president after he had a heart attack running for president. You don't have to reach all the way back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt to find serious health problems in the White House. In the 21st century, we had a vice president who had four heart attacks before he became vice president. Dick Cheney's first heart attack was when he was 37 years old. 
Vice President Cheney had a life-saving heart surgery in 2005 that, if it failed, would have made Republican House Speaker Dennis Hastert the next in line for the presidency. And years later, Dennis Hastert went to prison after confessing to the sexual abuse of high school kids when he was a high school wrestling coach. The Senate is a deliberative body. Senators never have to make quick, irreversible decisions. They can take their time and think about each vote they cast in the Senate, and they usually cast their votes in accordance with the positions they have taken in their campaigns. And so, as with all such debates, the only thing that really matters in what was said last night is how we can expect the candidates to vote in the Senate. And so far, only one campaign ad has been produced using the words of one of the candidates in last night's debate. This is who Dr. Oz wants in charge of women's health care decisions. I want women, doctors, local uh, political leaders, <laughs> local uh, political leaders, <laughs> local uh, political leaders. Oz would let politicians like Doug Mastriano ban abortion without exceptions, even in cases of rape, incest, or life of the mother. Oz is too extreme for Pennsylvania. How painful was it? to watch a physician who used to fully support every woman's right to make their own reproductive choices, say last night, in the hope of winning Donald Trump's voters in Pennsylvania, that what he called local political leaders should be making that choice for women. How painful was that to watch?